what is your name and what is your role at Winners Mill? And the first person is Miss Lee, so you can go ahead and answer that question. Well, Aaliyah, did you choose me become the oldest? No, you're just the first name on my list. Oh, I'm so. just checking. <laughs> I'm going to order. Well, I am a instructional assistant here at Wonders Mills, and I have been here since the opening of the school. Okay, um, next person is Ms. Harris. I am Ms. Allison Harris. I am an instructional assistant at Winters Mill, and this is my fifth year being here. All right, um, Ms. Morton, you're next. Um, my name is Michelle Morton. Um, this is my second year being here, and I am now in the uh, main office. Mr. Claiborne. Uh, I'm Mr. Claiborne, and um, I'm a permanent sub. And this is my first year here with this man. And finally, Mr. Brown, the man everybody loves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Michael Brown, principal of Winters Mill High School, and I am in my fourth year as a principal here. All right, so we're going to move on to the second question, which is how would you describe your cultural background? And it's going to go in the same order as the first question. So, Ms. Lee, Ms. Harris, Ms. Morton, Mr. Claiborne, and then Mr. Brown. So, Ms. Lee, you can go first. Hi. Yes, I would describe my culture background as a, I'm an Afro-American female, and I grew up in the country of West Virginia, my guy, West Virginia. And I, but I, my husband would say that I'm more of a Marylander than a West Virginia because I've lived here more than 40 some years. And I, because I have a 44 year old son. And I grew up in the 60s with a single mom of four. I was poor and didn't even know it. So that's my <laughs> cat bulk culture background. Okay, Ms. Harris. Okay, for me, I am, um, I was not born in America. But I am American citizen. I am from the Caribbean, the beautiful island of Grenada. It is known as the Isle of Spice. We have all the spices like nutmeg, clove. We have uh, cinnamon. Um, our country have a mixed culture and uh, it is from the British. We were ruled under the British and we, our culture were mixed with African American. No, sorry, Africans. We are. Uh, 90 something percent African descendant and uh, eight percent um, Indians. And um, our country is very small. The population is about 112,000. And if you look on the world map, it's just like a dot on the world map. And if you permit me, I know it's a culture talk, but there is just a little verse I want to sing that tells about my culture. It says, our sea island is crystal clear, and so it is all through the year. Coconut palm and grape trees line the shore. We will make you feel home once more. Fishing is a lovely sport. You can go in an open boat. Spend your vacation happily. Tell tales to friends and family. I am from Grenada, if you please. The Spice Island of the West Indies. I am happy, peaceful, and gay, beautiful, and happy in every way, and the warm sunshine every day. And that's my culture. <laughs> I like that song. And your that's culture nice. sounds amazing. All right, so next we have Ms. Morton. Well, I don't have no song. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I got one of them. Um, but I am from Baltimore. Um, I grew up in the city. Um, I am the youngest of four girls, like Miss Lee. My mom was a single mom of four daughters. Um, and I grew up in what would be considered a really rough part of the city. Um, but I think that has a big part of the young woman that I've grown up into now. Um, so that's my cultural background. I have a big family. Um, 
lots of nieces and nephews. We were four girls, no brothers, so we were raised to be tough. Right. Me too. Me too. Mm -hmm. right. Next, we have Mr. Claypool. Um, I'm from Westminster. I'm from here. Um, I'm the youngest of three. I got an older brother named Keith, older brother named Shaniqua. Um, and my cult my cultural background, well, just being in Westminster, like if you know if you're from here, like there's basically like two sides. It's like it's like what well, the all black side and then like there's the rest of Westminster. So if you know the all black side, 95 is probably my family. So the Cosley family or or you know, the um even the Claiborne family, that's basically all my side. So like I come from like, Westminster and I have a lot of family here and um and it's you know it's a great you know I like coming from a big family. I really really, really like it. Mr. Brown. All right. Um, so I am an African American male. Uh, I am uh, originally from Edgewood, Maryland, which is in Harford County. Um, my parents uh, migrated to Harford County from uh, Dundalk, Maryland, uh, from a historic all black community known as Turner Station. So um, most people uh, that came from down south, my grandparents migrated to the Baltimore area from places uh, like Wilson, North Carolina, uh, like uh, Southern Virginia to come to uh, Baltimore for work. Um, my grandfather's worked at the steel mill called Bethlehem Steel, uh, which is no longer around, but my father also worked there as well for over 40 years. So we have a hardworking um, family. Most of my family still lives in that Dundalk, um, you know, area. Uh, so it's very historic and very proud of that. Most of my extended family still live in North Carolina, um, in, in the Virginia area. So, um, you know, proud to, you know, share my heritage with, with everybody and where I'm from. All right. It sounds like you all had a nice life. Um, life's not life's not over yet, but you know I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. I we are currently still. Here. All right, so for the third question, um, what was your experience growing up in your family, and what ways has it impacted you? And Miss Lee, you are first. Ah uh, yes, I want to go back and say, and even if you edit this, Keon didn't say he was a one of the first graduates from Winters Mills High School. Just to let you know that I did. Graduate. Okay, you say. That's why we have the family over here. She's gonna check me. She's gonna tell me. Yeah, and when he said, and then when he said family, he didn't tell that we were related either. Yeah, but I'll, I thought I'll that was my, that out there. my fault. My fault. My fault. I thought that was. I'm dope. just gonna put it my all fault. out there. But getting back to, getting back to the question in hand, growing up in, in your family and how it impacted me. I am a product of growing up in the '60s, and um, I'm sorry I have to tell my age like that, but. <laughs> it's I grew up during the time of segregation and I have an aunt who was a, a principal of an all black school and she was very strict on education and my mother worked there. She worked in the cafeteria. So I had my first educational experience in an all black school and from there by the time I was in the second grade, maybe the, it was the second we got segregated and I had to go to a you know, be segregated with other people. Well, you know, I, I was the youngest, so I, a lot of stuff was hidden from me. You know, I didn't understand a whole lot of things, but one of the things that when your parent told you to do something, you did it. And my mother said, I could not leave the house and go to school in the morning without my brother. And my brother had to hold my hand all the way to school and all the way back to school. And I, you know, I kept thinking, I know what I'm doing. I don't need anybody to tell me to hold my hand. But it took me to grow up to realize that she was kind of fearful for the segregation part and us coming together. So growing up, you know, in that part, that that was a big deal for us and our family. But, you know, we survived, you know, we survived. All right, um, Ms. Harris. Okay, well, I, I grew up in a family. My mom, she had uh, six of us and she was a single parent and I lived with her until I was 12 years. I lived with my neighbor and the reason I lived with my neighbor, I went to high school and her daughter went to preschool and I took her daughter to preschool and she did not legally adopted me, but she treated me as one of her own and uh, she had three children and sometimes i even think that she treated me 
better than she treated them. And she was a spiritual leader and she valued education. And um, I think that's had an impact in my life. And today we still have a, a relationship. And in my country, there was nothing like segregation. I only knew about segregation when I came to America. And when I came to America, um, there was a culture shock because in my country, whenever you meet someone, you have to greet them. Hello, good afternoon, good morning. And when I come to this country and while I was walking the street, I was like, good morning. And then people would just pass you. And I was like, really? So that was like a culture shock to me. And being here, I learned a lot about uh, American history because back in my country, we did West Indian history. So that's this. All right, um, Ms. Morton. Uh, my cultural background. Um, I, growing up in my family, I was the youngest. Um, I was sport riding. Um, to this day, I'm still sport riding. Um, four girls, um, but our family was family. It was just what I just believe the definition of family is, just support for one another, always there for one another, no matter what, no matter the time, no matter nothing. We are, and to this day, we are still there for each other. Um, growing up, I just remember so much fun. I was shielded from a lot because I was the youngest. You know, my sisters got to experience a lot more than I did. Um, but it was fun. I remember my childhood being so much fun and just family and food, so much food. And, you know, we did Sunday dinners and um, things like that. And it was just fun. And it's impacted me now to always find the good in things, no matter how bad something may seem, no matter how rough something is, there is always something good that works within it, no matter what. And you, and you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? You see, you know, when you come out on the end of you, like, oh, I see why they had to work out that way. So that's something that I always remember. We had a lot of struggles in the family, but I didn't know it because we wore it well. You know, we got through things together. So my cultural background is just that family family we stick together no matter what um that's something that i try to instill in my daughter is that no matter what you go through mama gonna be here you know daddy's gonna be here family is gonna be here no matter what because that's that's what we do and and life is hard but you got your family if you got your family you can make it through anything in the world all right um Mr. Clayton. Um, kind of similar to um, Michelle and um, Miss Lee. Um, not kind of and not like I was like shielded, but not because Keon going to see if the water hot. I'm going to test it. I'm going to touch the stove and see if it's hot. I'm going to ask the question. I'm like, what's that? <laughs> I was probably was supposed to be shielded, but me being me, I'm going to ask it and figure out. No. So the shield probably would have supposed to be up, but it wasn't because I knocked it down. But definitely, like they said, family is big. Um, my grandfather, he went to Robert Moton out here, you know, when it was the all black school and he was on the championship team when they won it um, all the way down to me, who was on the county championship team in 2016. So it's like basketball trick was all the way down. I didn't even really think of that. Until I just said it. That's actually kind of kind of weird. But um, so always just supporting each other and and everything we did. My brother and me are two years apart, so we're really close. So my sister and me, she's 10 years apart, but me and her, you can we sound like we twins the way we talk but so it's just always just big on big on family you know my mom is still my brother to be good young man you know yes man no sir stuff like that and just always carry that on our shoulder that like you know everywhere you go you are you know gonna be looked at as you know because you're black you know you're gonna be looked at a certain way so don't give them another reason you know come come correct be educated stuff like that and mr brown yeah so um grew up in a um you know, two-parent household, um, again, like in, in Hartford County. I have one older brother uh, who's about seven years older than me. Um, and he, um, you know, really helped to, you know, he wasn't like raising me, but I really looked up to my brother a lot because of kind of like the, the age gap between us. 
So I was able to see things way before uh, it ever happened. So I got to see him go to high school, uh, me still kind of be in elementary school, but seeing, um, you know, what that looks like, what I need to, you know, pattern my life after. Uh, my parents played a huge role. My mother was a registered nurse. Um, she really preached education uh, a lot. Um, really, really hardworking lady um, would would sacrifice for us and, and work further away and have hour and a half long commutes to and from work just to make sure that we stayed in, in the same school system. And, um, you know, we had a certain education. My father, again, like I said, was a steel worker, um, hardworking guy. Um, I got to see what a, uh, a black male, what a male look figure looks like through my dad, you know, and like I said, there's not perfect dads out there, but I feel like my father is probably the closest to a perfect dad that you're going to, you're going to get was always involved. Uh, I played sports a lot. My brother and I coached teams. He was always, he was always there. He was always around and always supportive, even as I matriculated on to college. So um, for me, I got to see, you know, how that positive daily impact of, you know, positive male role models have on your life. And I know how important that is uh, from a black male's perspective when, you know, I, I grew up in an all white county where, um, you know, everything wasn't nice all the time for us, um, you know, similar to, you know, Carroll County, um, you know, similar counties. And it wasn't it wasn't all the way easy. So it's things that we had to deal with. But knowing um, who you are, where you come from and, and having those positive male role models to kind of guide you through some of those difficult uh, situations really helped me out uh, a lot. So. All right. um, can I add on to the question? Sure. All right. So um, growing up with my family, it was OK for a little bit. You know, I got all the love that I needed from my grandma and my mom and my brothers. That That's the most important part. But I did, you know, struggle a lot growing up because my mom, she had back problems and everything. So, you know, her being a single mother, it was hard for her to, you know, make sure we ate and, you know, just get, get us clothes and stuff. But she did what she had to do. Like as a single mom, she did, she did what she had to. And I say this proudly because it was hard, but she did it. And I'm proud of her, honestly, like I'm really proud of her. But um, as I was growing up, I didn't really receive all the other love from, you know, my aunts, my uncles and all of them. Um, I don't, you know, can't say too much up here, but they weren't really the family that I actually needed. So the people I consider my family are not, you know, blood related to me, but they always looked out, make sure I was good. They still make sure I'm good till this day. And um, the way that it impacted me is, it impacted me to be a stronger woman, honestly, to know that I can do stuff by myself without the help of other people. I mean, all I need is my mom is my brother. So as long as I have them, then I'm fine. So they are the people that I consider family because everybody else, you know, they congratulate me on stuff when they want to, but they're, they wasn't there when I needed them the most when I was struggling and actually needed stuff. They weren't there. So I'm just happy I have my mom and my brother. So I'm good with them. That's awesome, Malia. That's awesome. All right. Um, how much time do we have? Go ahead. We got time. So you go ahead. All right. So for the fourth question, it's is there a historical figure or a role model that you look up to and who is it and why? And Miss Lee, you're first. Well, you know, I think we all kind of got something in common kind of here. Like I'm a product of a, being the, the last child, too. So I kind of too, Michelle was full. That's what my brother tells me all the time I was the spoiled one and so growing up my impact would definitely be my mom because she worked hard to put food on the table and not only has she always worked one job she most her given life she worked two and she always made sure her children were well taken care of she would tell anybody that she loved us and that was the key to our childhood we never went a day without our mom and us telling each other how much we loved each other. And so that really helped me growing up to be the individual that I am today and stuff. And then in my historical family, I, we are horse owners and horse trainers. So my aunt in this early 
I mean, probably the 50s, she became the first female black woman to own and train horses. So she said she has a book out and she has a lot of historical facts and we honor her every year for being that, that pioneer to set the, the, the track for other women to become horse owners. Not only women weren't allowed to be horse owners, there's only men, but now she set the track that women could not only be owners, but trainers too. So those people, I had plenty of role models in my life, but I will put my mom first. All right, um, Ms. Harris. Um, my role model would be my, um, who I consider to be my adopted mom, my neighbor who grew me up. Um, she instilled great moral values in me and uh, taking care of me and all the things that she did for me, it has impacted my life and I consider to be my role model. But if I'm looking for a historical figure in America, I looked at Maya Angelou. I love her writings and her inspirational quotes. And one of the quotes I really love and I apply to my life today, it says, people forget what you say. People will forget what you do, but people will not forget how you make them feel. And yeah. as I go through life, the life that I live, I try to have an impact on others so that uh, they, um, my life would be an impact on others, basically. All right, um, Ms. Morton. Um, I definitely have to agree. Um, my mom is my role model, will always be my role model. And I lost my mom when I was 17. Um, but she was the definition of strength. Um, seeing my mom, she did what she had to do. Again, we struggled like everybody else, but you didn't know it. You didn't know it. And she worked, she worked to the end, to the very end of her life. Um, and I would say my mom and my sisters, my sisters are to me the definition of strength as well. I get to see them with, with whatever life throws at them, they keep it going, they keep moving. Um, you know, they they work hard. Um, they no matter what comes, they always are finding a way. It's always thinking of what's coming next. I gotta, so I have to do this for my kids. I have to do this. You know, they're, you, we all have weak moments, right? But in them, you don't see them. They don't allow you to see them because they have to keep going. We don't have a choice to fail. We can't fail. And my my mom and my sisters literally to me are the definition of strength. Um, historical figure, I would have to say Coretta Scott King. I think that she is another uh, figure of strength. We watched her, you know, Martin Luther King gets he did a lot, but he could not have done it without Coretta. She was behind him. She made such a humongous impact in the civil rights movement. Um, and she did so much after his death that we don't always talk about. So I think she is literally what strength looks like. And so my mom, my sisters, and Miss Mrs. King. All right, um, Mr. Cleveland. Um right down the line same as my mom um you know she always just always go to work you know multiple jobs stuff like that no complaints um and i seen you know, if i seen her do that me going to school or you know playing basketball is something easy so her just you know sacrificing for us stuff like that has always been a um a big light and in, in my head and she just say little even little things like just go with your first instinct like little things like that you be like what does that mean and then it, later in life you'd be like you know i know what that means like just go with your first thought, you know, don't even think about it. Little things like that help me throughout life, especially in sports, stuff like that. Um, historically, I probably have to say, um, I mean, I love LeBron. You know, I really like what he stands for, how he puts, you know, himself out there on the front line, goes against the grain, um, stands on, you know, black history, black culture, stuff like that. Coming from a, a single, you know, mom household um, and being as big as he is. So I really look up to LeBron James. Mr. Brown. Yeah, just like other people have said, I mean, my, uh, you know, my parents played, uh, you know, a really huge role um, on, on who I am and uh, individuals that I really look up to. You know, my mom passed away when I was about 22 years old, but that was, um, you know, it was really devastating for me because, you know, she was really one that really pushed, again, pushed education, 
um, really believed in me as an individual and where I, I was going. Um, and so everything I do now, um, you know, in my career is really dedicated to um, my mother because she's the one that really saw those those qualities really early on and, and nurtured to those qualities. Um, you know, also my, my father, again, I get my, um, uh, you know, my worker's mentality from, you know, my father, you know, uh, he always had um, a way of keeping you humble regardless. Um, didn't matter how much success you may have, whether that be on, uh, you know, the sports field or in life. He never let me um, get too full of myself and always reminded me to stay humble um, and stay hungry because, you know, the minute that you lose focus on that, you lose a part of, of yourself. And so that's something that I always keep with me um, and, and try to instill in my kids is, is to stay humble no matter how much you have. Things can get taken away from you in a heartbeat. And so um, you never want to get to a point where you're too high on yourself. And from a historical perspective, there's so many people um, that I read about, still learning about. But one person that will always stick out to me is uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and he was kind of like the trailblazer of black intellectuals, you know, at, at his particular time. Um, before then, you know, you had other people, black people that were intellectuals, but that wasn't respected in the white communities like that. He was one of the first people that was respected uh, in the white communities where people uh, that did not look like us would also read his books and would also respect his research. Um, and he was also an individual that um, throughout his course of time really gave up his life to the betterment of black people in the world. He didn't just worry about black people in America. He worried about black people everywhere, in Africa, wherever. Uh, he traveled abroad and he really gave his 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 life to that. So he's definitely a person that um, you know, that I look up to. All right. Um I want to add on to that question. So a role model for me is my mom and my grandmother. Um my grandma always raised me to, you know, treat people with respect and to always pursue my dreams, which is to hopefully be a nurse. And I'm pushing for that. So because she could she could always tell like she always used to tell me, you know, I always have a thing for helping people or like just helping people. That's something I've always liked to do. And I still do it till this day. Like even if I'm not getting help from the person I'm sorry, I'm helping. I'm still going to help them regardless. Like, that's just the type of person I am. And for the historical figure part, I feel like any African American that has pushed to, you know, fight for our freedom, our rights, you know, just anything we can do is who I look up to. Especially Martin Luther King, um, women, honestly, all women, like they, you know, the ones who fought for women's rights and just everything. And Maya Angelou, I love her. She's she was a good person. Um, okay, for the fifth question is do you have a favorite artist and who and why? It doesn't matter if it's music, performing, visual arts, anything like that. Um, Ms. Lee. Yeah, Aaliyah, that's a good question for me because I, I kinda like when I was your age, I grew up learning soul train. <laughs> and I, I couldn't her. wait for every Saturday till Soul Train came on. You know, we had to clean our house, but we watched Soul Train. <laughs> and so I grew up on a lot of old artists like Aretha Franklin who sang Respect. But today, if you would ask me today, I, I just like a variety of music and cultures. I love a good jazz person like Herbie Hancock. And I love a good gospel singer like Shirley Caesar and Mahalia Jackson, you know, so, you know, my spiritual roots, I had those and grew up in gospel, but you can't be in a black culture and not love music in general, because I love music. Give me a good beat and I'm all right. Miss <laughs> <laughs> um, Harris. Okay, for me, my um, I have so many favorite music, but I love um, gospel. And I love the um, artists like the Winers, uh, Shirley Caesar, Kurt Franklin. These are the music I like. But as a Caribbean woman, you can't leave out the soca, 
and the calypso and the reggae and especially the stir pan. This is what I grew up in. So these are my favorite music. I have so many of them. I cannot single out one type of music. Yes, I love reggae music. I, I hear a reggae song, I get up and dance. That's me and my mom both, um, Miss Morton. Um, just like Miss Harris and Miss Lee, gospel, gospel everything. I can't pick a favorite gospel singer. It's just entirely too many. Um, but if I had to pick my favorite, Whoopi Goldberg. I think that she can do anything. I think that she can show anything. I think that she can portray any person on screen. I love her. I love her work ethic. Um, the Color Purple is my absolute favorite movie in the whole world. Um, and I just don't think, I think if you give her a script, she can She can do anything. Um, Mr. Claiborne? Um, I mean, I'm an old soul too. You know, I like Michael Jackson, um, but then I could go to like I like Biggie Smalls, Jay Z, Drake. So I just like rap, hip hop, music, all in general. Mr. Brown. Yeah. Uh, so this one is is tough, you know, because I really really love like music. Like that's like one of the things that just gets me going. So um, to pick one artist is like blast for me, but. For the sake of this conversation, um, you know, I will say the artist that probably reflects more so of like, you know, uh, you know, my upbringing and just like, you know, takes me back to a certain time and also is still pushing envelopes today is probably uh, Jay Z. I mean, he's probably the tops. I mean, he could probably drop an album, you know, ten years from now. I'll probably still be listening and probably the world will as well just because he's that iconic of a figure also much respect for him um you know being a billionaire and really pushing the envelope on the business side he's doing a lot of things um that people don't really take notice of and still buying up a lot of different companies and trying to make things better for for black people black and brown people him and his wife beyonce um so that's somebody and also on the acting side, I can't cannot like I said, my mom would probably says blasphemy, but I gotta put Denzel Washington in there. Um, he's just iconic. I mean, you know, I love uh, you know Sidney Poitier uh, is is another one, but he is he's definitely one that is iconic. Um, somebody that really has given a a voice to black people in, as far as the art of acting, and I don't think you will see as many. Uh, black shows, as many black movies, as many black actors, if it wasn't for all the things that Denzel has done in, in the profession of acting. So I got to give him respect. All right, um, the next question is, why do you think it's important for people of color to be represented in education? And Ms. Lee, you can go. I think it's very important because as a culture of being a, a black woman, it, it helps fight racism. And it's it's a learning symbol for our, our culture of freedom because we we didn't always have the opportunity to read or write. We weren't given those opportunities, so we need those opportunities. We need education to be represented and stuff. And it's a step towards us achieving equality and independence as a as a, a race. And we were denied education, like I said before, and so. That's why it's very important. We need to not be denied. And I think that's why it's important to have education in the black culture. All right. Um, I'm going to add on to that before I forget what I was going to say. Um, I think it's really important because when segregation was going on, it wasn't fair that Amen. We, the black schools, they were getting hammy down books from white schools, books that were messed up books that you know the pages were torn out and stuff it wasn't fair that it wasn't enough teachers and they just they weren't they weren't getting the same you know treatment that white people were getting so it was never fair but i'm happy that you know schools aren't segregated you know, you know, anymore but still in some schools is you know a little bit of racism here and there but i never blame the kids for acting the way they do i blame their parents because their parents, you know, raised them a certain way. They raised them to not like people of color, and I think that's really messed up. But, um, yeah. Um, 
is heresy. Well, it, this question was very hard for me to answer because I grew up in a country where we are predominantly black and we were not, um, education was not denied from anyone. But why I think um, black people should be represented in education, it prevents like biasness and it set high expectation for others knowing that they would not be mistreated and misrepresented and they can achieve anything that they put their mind into once they put the effort into it. Miss um, Martin. Um, I think it's important for people of color to be represented because sometimes we think because we're from a certain place that you can't go further. And I think when you see other people in it, you know, I think I think it's a big thing. I was so, you know, I didn't know anything about this school when I came here. Um, and when I came here, it was a black principal. And I'm going to pick on Mr. Brown a little bit right now, but he is this big, tall black man who didn't really wear a suit when I first met him. And to me, that is that's so important for people to see because we have this idea of what it's supposed to look like. And if you're you, that's what it's supposed to look like. And you can be you with an education. And I think that's super important to look like, you know, I think it's important for young black women to see me here. I'm a little old black young woman sitting in the front office. I ain't got no hair. It's not all down my back. Half the time it's a different color, you know, and I, I wear craziness all the time. But I think it's important to see each other, to see that you don't have to look a certain way, that as long as you as long as you're you, you can you can do it just like everybody else, but you can do it your way. And I think that is so important to see um, that just be you and that, that needs to be seen in education. You can be you and still be smart and still hold a degree and still be whatever you want to be. All right, um, Mr. Claiborne. Um, just piggyback. If I was Mr. Brown, I was the principal. I promise you, they won't see me in no suit either. But anyway, <laughs> um, they see me in straight. We know, we know like they see you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but just say, um, just to, um, like Miss Harris says, you know, takes um, the bias. And like I, I relate a lot of things to sports. Like the more you know, we're educated, and the more people hear us talk, it won't be a narrative of oh, he talks good for a black kid. You know what I'm saying? Or a black man. It'll be. He just talks good, you know what I'm saying? So, like, I've always been big on communication. And when I talk, I don't sound like, you know, I, you know, I'm not educated or anything like that. So I'm saying the more we're educated, the more we see that, that narrative will have to go away because it's going to be like everyone's going to be able to just sound the same. Mr. Um, Brown? Yeah, I mean, so, Michelle, you know, thank you for that, though. Um you know, I you have to try to do things the, the best way that you know how. And my thing is through my upbringing, um, it's always been about uh, you setting the example um, for others. You know, so I, I'm never unaware that people are watching me each and every day and what I do, what I say, what I wear, um, the whole nine yards. And I do everything with a purpose. So never think that I come in here not wearing a suit that is not a purpose to it. I can actually I have many suits. I could wear a suit every day if I so choose. Um, but I choose to dress the way that I do uh, for representation of the, the students and to continue to try to break down barriers in our school and in our community. And sometimes wearing a suit can give off a certain aura that you are better than somebody else. And I'm not better than anybody else. It doesn't matter the lowest student here, the lowest faculty member here, no matter what job you have, I'm on, I want to come across that I'm on the same level as you are. Like there is no difference. So I think, um, you know, education, I think that's important. Also, I will go one step further. I think it's, it's, vital for people that don't look like us to see somebody like myself in this particular role because they may not see anybody else in this role maybe the rest of their life and that is facts yeah that's just reality they may never see anybody in this particular position again in their life 
So it's important that when they see me, that they remember later on in life what that kind of looked like. And, and that, Keon, and others, that can change your perspective on how you deal with people of color mm-hmm. from henceforth and forevermore. And that, Aaliyah, is how you change and break that chain of teaching your kids certain things when you now have perspective on what that looks like because you had a relationship with a black man who was your principal. And now when you have a kid, it changes your perspective on what you teach that child. And that's how you change things. Um, So on the last question, and the question is, what is something you would like for people to know about celebrating Black History Month? And Ms. Lee, you can go ahead. Well, I want to say, to have this last question, this is a history-making moment for me right now. Because I have been in this school since I've been, it's been open. And this is the first time I've ever been asked to be involved almost in any kind of chat, talk, or anything. And it does my heart well because I'm going to put it out there. This is going to be my last year here because I'm retiring. And so it does my heart well to see so many people on the screen be in color and stuff because as a culture, you know, it's, it hasn't been easy. And to see Mr. Brown represent Winters Mills for me to go out on that light, it's definitely a light. That is definitely shining on this school right now. And I'm, I just pray that that light will continue to shine on this school. And I think that it's very important for us to celebrate black cultures because it gives us an opportunity to not only showcase our struggles of the past, but our achievements of the future too. Because if we look at Mr. Brown, he's our achievements of the future. Because we got a lot of other people that, you know, without our struggles, we couldn't have a future. So that's why I think it's important for us to continue to celebrate black history. So what Ms. Lee said about Mr. Brown, you know, being an African-American man and being the principal, I was, when I came here, I seen that it was predominantly, you know, white students, white teachers. And when I met Mr. Brown, I looked at my mom, I'm like, the principal is black? Like, what? he's black. <laughs> I was so happy. I was, I was really happy, you know. It, it felt good to have, you know, a person of color you know, having the role that you have and, you know, it just inspired me to be a better student and stuff because I had, uh, you know, I got in trouble just a little bit while I was here, but I'm not going to make that mistake again. Um, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, I'm staying on track. I'm keeping my grades up and stuff. So Thank you. Thank you, Aaliyah. That means a lot. I'm doing better. I'm doing better. Um, <laughs> Ms. Harris, you can go ahead with the question. You're you're on mute. I want to thank those who invited me to be a part of this culture talk. It took a lot for me to do that. Someone with little words and uh, not so much words. I am always the shy type, but I was able to pull through. Um, Why should we celebrate Black History Month? Because to me, it raised a level of awareness on the contributions and the sacrifice and achievements that so many African Americans did in US history. And based on their contribution and their sacrifice, it impacts our lives today. And that's who we are as Black people, the impact they have on our lives today. All right, um, Ms. Morton. Um, <clears throat> what I want people to know about celebrating Black history, um, that we are fire, we're spicy. We're, we're, we're so much, you know, and we're so much more than the struggle that is always associated with celebrating Black history. Um, but we are, we're, um, we're, we're, we're amazing. We're, um, we're fun. We're creative. We're super smart. Um, that's what I, th- that's what I think is super important that, you know, even, you know, I heard you say, you know, you're not going to mess up no more. Even with your mistakes, you're still amazing. You know, you're still this young woman who is, you know, doing emceeing a a cultural chat for the few Black people in this school. That is an accomplishment. So I think, you know, we celebrate because we are, we're, we're hot, we're fire. 
And that's something that I always have to tell myself, you know what, despite all of the stuff that we've gone through and they're still trying, you know, people are still trying to stop us from being able to do so much. That is because we do cause change. Mm -hmm. You know, when we come together, we do cause change. When we work together, we can make things happen. And, you know, that's, that's amazing right there. That's what we are. We're amazing. Um, Mr. Claiborne? Um, I think, you know, it's it's important to shine light on it because we get, you know, conversations like this. Not to say we can't get these in, you know, September, but, you know, it's, a, you know, that's what Black History Month is about, you know, for chats like these and, and stuff like that and to show how special we are, you know, in Black culture and um, just to even piggyback on everybody else, how they said Mr. Brown was the principal. When I, when I, he came in, like, right after I left, and I was, like, low-key mad because, like, I was like a known popular kid. I'm like, if ideas I had, Mr. Brown would have backed it. We could have, whatever, though. I, change saying, the world, Mr. King, change the world, Keon. Right, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. King was cool, but I can't really go with him some certain ideas about, you know what I'm saying? But Mr. Brown would have been like, you know what I'm standing on it, and ain't nobody going to say nothing to me. Baby going to throw him off if they do. But anyway, <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. What I'm saying, that's important to know that, like, just to even look and be like, you know, you got a black principal, like, if it's one, you know, it's more than anything. Just have one, you know what I'm saying? All right, guys, start with one. All right, Mr. Brown. Man, uh, thank you, everybody, for that, for all the love. I was not expecting all that love on this particular call, so I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm blown away with that. But, um, you know, seriously, you know, Black History Month, I want people to understand that it is not just a month. I know we get February. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm coming for all the months, you know what I'm saying? Because we are American history, and it's time for us to start saying that. Black history is American history. Our ancestors fought, died for this country, and it is historical fact. So to just say, okay, Black history, you're limiting you know, the greatness of our contributions. And that's not something that I'm going to sit here and, you know, try try to say. So for me, we first need to understand that. Um, <laughs> other thing is, you know, Black history, I find out more about it each and every day. Everyone who is, is Black or who is not Black <clears throat> really have to spend a lot of time to research and read and understand black history because now is the time where information is out there for everyone whether you are literate or not you can find out about black history if you just take a time to look for it and it is astounding the stuff that i have learned over the past i would say five ten years i mean it's astounding and it makes me thirst for more every time i read a book or see something I want to find out more right I want to go deeper and that's something that everybody needs to understand and last thing I will say is realize that our culture right is American culture as well I remember a time where and Keon you're a young guy but people when I say this there was a time when I was growing up the hip-hop was like you know this underground culture, if you will, right? So, like, you know, if you weren't Black, you weren't listening to hip-hop. That just was how that was. And so it was very underground, very, you know, um, unknown. And so we've now gotten to a place where if you talk to a kid, Keon, you talk to somebody, kid in your class, and you Mm -hmm. say, hey, man, just scroll through your playlist. Let me see what you're listening to. Whether they white or Black, they're probably going to be listening to the same music and most of all of it has hip hop undertones to it. Does it matter? Right. That's the top songs out there right now, which is crazy to me when I see that, because that tells me that black culture is popular culture for the first time in history. It is popular culture. And so we need to recognize that. So how can you hold it to, one month when we're listening to this music and we're seeing this culture each and every day 
So that's what I want people to know about Black history. All right. Um. So that was the last question. Um. Do you have anything else I would like to add on before Miss Martin speaks? Well, I would personally like to say, Leah, and I think I speak for everybody. You did a phenomenal job. Thank you. Phenomenal, honestly. Um, to come yes. in here and do this culture chat um, with all the adults here on the call and act like you are an adult because I feel like you're an adult already, yes. right? Even though you haven't graduated yet, you're already an adult. But I'm going ahead and claiming the graduation. I told you. I'm Thank claiming you. the graduation I already. <laughs> I felt like you did. If I could yeah, piggyback on that for Aaliyah, you know, when Aaliyah first met me, she cried. She'll tell people that she cried because I reminded her of her grandmother. And so I, today I see your grandmother smiling down on you. And I am so proud. And, and I have the face of your grandmother right now. So I'm so proud of you. Don't make me cry. <laughs> me too, Miss <Ms>. Lee. <laughs> well, thank you, Aaliyah. Appreciate thank you. you. Ms. Martin, thank you for putting this together. This was this was great. You are welcome. I love it. I love getting to know a little bit more. Every time we do one of these things, I learn more about people and it's it's awesome. So thanks you guys for sharing. Thank you.